Okay. I'm calling Chris Langhart. Hello, Chris. Wait, I got to call him. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. He won't, he won't answer you, Bill. Oh. Because he's not here. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> I knew I was doing something wrong. <laughs> yep. Chris. <clears throat> Hi, Michael. Hi, everybody. Hi, how are you doing? Oh. Pretty good. How are you? We're good. We're good. Yeah, you quarantined up there. Hi, yeah, how are we, you? We are. We are. Hi. <laughs> but everybody's good. Hey, Chris, we, we, how are you, sir? How are you doing? Are you all right? Yes. Okay, I'm, good. I'm about to get booked up here. Okay, I just wanted to let you know we just see. Nick Langhart's uh, the, the the square. We don't hear you or see you or anything. So. Oh, I just I just I didn't know that Nick was going to be on it. I just oh. said the thing so he would know about it. Okay, let me. I know you both. You all, all authors have been on him. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, don't don't give me a hard time. I was mixed up with Hanley. You know, I can't. Hey, if Hanley's on here and you're not, man, I don't know. Hey, uh, but. But I'm lucky to have Nick because he keeps track of all the time too. Okay. All right. All right. I'll see you. I'll see you, man. I'll see you, man. Bye, bye. Pleasure. That was Chris Langhart. He's he's working on it. He's he's actually a very funny guy. If you catch Chris's humor, he says some funny stuff. It's really funny. We know. I know. I was gonna say. You know, he's incredible. He's brilliant. No, oh, incredible. Bill, remember when he made that? modification to your refrigerator because the the handle in your fridge was dropping all the the food yeah so he's like oh i'll just go whip something up he went in your barn came back with this fabricated fridge handle <laughs> very quickly <laughs> oh here we go jock are you trying to get back into the room i see another jocko unless it's an impersonator uh -huh. On my phone now. I was gonna get into the room, but all right. It was, I mean, if you want to, if you want to oh, switch sorry. it up. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna. Just, for those who are here, I'm just gonna do quick bios and then roll right into some questions, and that's it. <clears throat> Have you guys been particip participated in any Woodstock-related media events or anything this year, Michael? I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> that means that means yes. T <laughs> Tisha, can you hear me? She's frozen. <clears throat> She's got a bad connection where she is. Bill, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good, good. good to see you. That was a good panel we had last night. Tish, Tish. Yep. Yes. Michael, is that your house in the back? Yes. It's so pretty. Yeah. Thanks. So, it, so it's not a bad place to be quarantined, is it? No, not at all. It's it's fantastic, actually. No, that's great. Yeah. And having the kids around all the time has been really nice too. Yeah. Cool. Are you going to set up the school or no school? Um, well, Harry's one of my boys is supposed to start Ithaca on the 6th of September, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Tricky. Yeah. It's a hard decision. Yeah. So right now he's scheduled. We'll see. Yeah. But staying in the dorms? Yeah. Yeah. And staying on campus, not, not being able to leave. Wow. One parent can only, one parent can go up with them. And <laughs> wow. Yeah. But what Tufts did was they, um, they only allowed freshmen and seniors to come on campus and nobody can live off campus so you have to live on yeah. campus yeah it's the same thing here except that they're they're only taking students from new york Mass massachusetts and connecticut. Think, maybe connecticut yeah yeah and then they ordered about a million adirondack chairs for the lawns <laughs> But you know they could they could send them home in a heartbeat. Something starts to break out, and they're and right. they're done. And they're going to test them like every two or three days. Yeah. Bye. See you in a couple days. 
Bye bye. You have reached the voicemail. Where did you go? You have reached the voicemail box. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Uh, oh. World comes in focus. John, you look like a surgeon. I do. What kind of surgeon? There's Chris. Chris. There. Hey, Chris. Some more light, Chris. And turn off your unmute. Lights it up like the Dickens. And so I have a piece of new density on the camera. Oh, there you go. Hey! Chris Langhart. We can and take it off it. because there's going to be rain soon, and therefore I will be lit less. <laughs> Hey, Chris, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, good. Say hello to everybody. We have Bill Hanley, Michael Lang, Jocko Marcelino, and uh, Tisha, who is having um, Wi-Fi issues, so she's in and out, but that's okay. That's good. Um, Where did you find the Michael Lang? He wasn't on your list. That was a surprise. <laughs> that was a surprise. Well, that's Yay. a good surprise. <laughs> it's authenticity. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it certainly yeah. does. All right. We're going to be. I'm, am I here? Do you hear me, guys? There you are. Yeah, yeah. I can. There's yeah. A, there's Yay, the, I'm back again. The recorded thing here. I, it covers up your <laughs> face, but there it goes. All right. I gets rid of that. All right. We're just waiting on two more people. It's five. It's 5.53, and I'll just get right into it at 6, and if people right. come in. You've got you know. your other authors. It was a good idea to get the several authors mixed together. Say that again? I say I thought it was a good idea to get the several authors mixed together. You think so? Yeah. Okay. You all come at it from a different angle. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris, did you read my book already? Is it you done with it or I read what? part of it? I'm okay. not I, I <laughs> pick up with it when I'm eating dinner and then I You put it, it back down. Yeah. I start again and then go again and again. Okay. I'll, well good. At least you're reading some of it. Oh yeah, no, I just I haven't gone right to cover to cover. Yeah, people about say they bounce. Wow, that's a first. That is a first. I've never seen someone sideways. How do we fix that? I, that's on her end. It's the way the phone. If she's. Oh, there hey! We go. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> oh wow! That's a new one. There it is, Mark. Be heard. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. You made it. You made it. You made it. Your sound is low, but from here, but I, it's not as loud as everybody else. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Can everybody see everybody? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. No sound is fine. Yes. Good. Yes. Can you hear Mama? I hear. I can hear you, Melanie. You sound good. Thank God. I'm yeah. on. <laughs> 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 All right, we be, we begin in a moment. And uh, John Morris. Everybody's frozen. Hoping for John Morris. Everybody's frozen. John, where are you? Boxes. We have Nick Langhart here, but I don't know. Is he participating in the panel too? Well, he's probably just monitoring. Okay. He, I don't think his camera worked because it didn't on the last time I had him. Okay. But uh, he is. He is good with backup dates, and you know, yes. I checked with John Chester. We've gotten into a discussion about sound, and he I, verified I, that Fillmore had had an event on the Tuesday before. No, uh, at Tanglewood, the oh. sound system was not always. <laughs> yes, it was a man anticipated that some speakers might come from the Fillmore East to help the Woodstock, but it couldn't yeah. be done because they were all at Tanglewood. Yeah. That's right. That's right. John Chester and, and Bob Goddard were at uh, Tango with the twos that Tuesday yeah. before the Woodstock event with the yeah. with the film. Then they arrived and said, "What shall we do?" And the first thing I did was send them off to to work. Yeah, that's what you said to me. It's a good story. It's a good one, man. I will save so, it until we get going. Yeah, definitely. So Michael Lang is here. Thank you, Michael Lang, for being here. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Jocko Marcelino from Shanana. We have the legendary 
Jocko and the legendary Melanie here, uh, two wonderful performers uh, who performed at, at Woodstock. Uh, we have Tisha Agri, who's your, you were the assistant to Michael Lang, but I, I don't really like to always just say that, but you, you did a lot more uh, than that. Um, um, Bill Hanley, the uh, pioneer sound engineer of the Woodstock sound system. And of course, Chris Langhart, technical director at, uh, at Woodstock, and I'll start off by asking Chris Langhart, what is a tech, what does a technical director do? Uh, well, the, at a the, festival? the term the, the term is stolen from theaters, who have technical directors because there needs to be somebody that coordinates the scenery, lighting, sound, all the rest of it. And not, nobody thought of me as technical director at the time. I mean, the, the official sounds, the official site person was supposed to be Mel Lawrence, but there was enough for both of us to be completely busy, so there was no problem. <laughs> We just, we didn't even discuss the sharing of the duties. We just kind of yeah. set out doing different things and whatever he did seemed to make sense and whatever I did made sense. And so we just went ahead without much communication at all. He'd already gotten all these tanks and um, they sat up there on the hill because that's where I decided they ought to go. Or actually he had them up there before. And uh, then I organized all this piping because it seemed logical that we needed to have all these water stations here and there. And so I um, saw these pipes coming up the hill and I said, uh, and this is where enlightened management, this is one of the big things that I think Woodstock is remarkable for. Um, they had, tip this up, Oops, too much. Um, they had uh, enlightened management by by fear, I suspect. <laughs> Everybody was like under the gun and had to figure out what to do. And, you know, so you could stand there at the top of the hill and you could see the gangs coming up with the pipes onto the top of the hill. And, and you could say to somebody, you know, it's going to be a problem getting all these pipes hooked on here with valves in a sensible way because there's no drawing. We really had time to work that out. But I know somebody that can do this out the back of their hand. And they said, well, why isn't he here? I said, because he's in California. And they said, oh, we'll fix that right away. And Bruce DeForest got stuck on a plane and bang, it was there. And all the pipes and valves went together and I never thought anything about it. And that was one of the remarkable things about the whole job is that I was able to, when something came up, I did know somebody who could like make the bridge by, you just wave your hands and say, make a bridge that goes like this. And here's the telephone poles and it'll hold it up and go buy a by 12 and hanging across the road and, and you know and he said well can I bring my friend and I said sure and so they were there and you know everybody laid a helping hand and so suddenly the bridge came into being. Yeah people for people a lot of people don't realize that there were water for facilities or crude water facility but piping in uh, well, you have the to get the water to the facility. Right <laughs> right but it doesn't come out of nothing. But even lighting, you know, uh, there was very little lighting outside of the the stage area. It was people were in the dark, right? Michael, could you attest to that? That the the, well, the, the we had, field we had Christmas tree lights in the forest. Yes. Right, that's right. And most of the stage lighting, as you probably know, stayed underneath the stage. That's warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there wasn't much to hang it on, and yeah. Chip is a pretty good guy with the follow spots, and so. Done is done. Yeah. And of course, Jocko, you play perform during the day, and, and, and Melanie, you perform at night. Did you? Yes. Do you recall the intensity of those spotlights on you and that blackness of the crowd? And no, I don't. Re I don't remember the spotlights. I only remember the candles, <laughs> because it was during that time, you know, that I was on that. Um, I don't. Who said? Um, Somebody announced, and I'm always saying wavy gravy, but I'm not totally sure not uh, that, that we are going to light candles and Hog Farm was handing out thousands of them and the light, my cuckoo clock just went off, sorry, um, the light um, from the candles will keep the rain away or something. I, at that point, was in my little tent, terrified and believing totally that the whole thing will everybody will go home because it's raining and of course they're going to go home it's raining and um not a chance the <laughs> announcement kind of filtered through and but it didn't really make much sense because i was in sheer terror <laughs> um so 
when I got on stage, that candle lighting was in full force. And I just witnessed can candles like flickering fireflies coming toward me. And this, in inspire this inspires your song, right? That exactly thing. That exact thing inspired candles and rain. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, so Peter, no my husband, who, who was the producer, wanted to call it um, Woodstock. Melanie called the song Woodstock. I said, no, no, it has to be called Candles in the Rain. If only I had called it Woodstock. <laughs> if only I had done that thing. But hey, you know, it you was know, Candles in the Rain. And that's know, what inspired it. It's so beautiful. And, and think of the songs that were inspired by Woodstock. And I want to ask Michael Lang when, and I don't, I don't know if you've ever been asked this, but what, what did you think of the song Woodstock when Joni Mitchell wrote that song? Were you, well, like in awe of that? And then of course, the Cros then of course, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, or Crosby, Stills, Nash uh, come out with their rendition of it. Well, Young, of course. Um, they came out with it first, actually. And oh. I, and I heard it. I ran into Steve Stills in L.A., and he said, you got to hear something. Follow me to my house. Wow. <clears throat> and he and Dallas Taylor played it for me. Wow. It was mind boggling. That must have been incredible. Yeah, it was. That yeah. really is incredible. Wow. Um, and Jocko, let you, Shana and I were kind of an odd. I mean, they were an, I, let me tell you something first about Shana and I. I grew up watching the show. So I, I loved Shana and I as a kid. But before that, of course, performing at Woodstock, how does a group like Shana and I get booked? And, it's uh, Michael, Michael Lang's fault. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> Michael, we like, what? And it was great. <laughs> well seen. And our diversity. <laughs> and Michael came down on our last night and uh, put us on the bill. It, we weren't advertised because we were a late entry. But I just spent three days out there with the guys. We kept rendezvousing backstage, and they say, come back Friday night. Come back Saturday. <laughs> Finally, we got on. We didn't have to worry about lighting. We got on Monday morning just before Jimmy. It was pretty extraordinary to see Jimmy grooving on what we were doing. And then, of course, doing one of the greatest musical sets that he ever did. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, it was an unbelievable time for a 19-year-old. That must have been... Well, there's a funny story here you because, know, oh, go ahead, uh, Tisha. I was just thinking, I was thinking about it. What really made it so phenomenal was everybody. I mean, everybody from the farmers to the musicians, to the people working, to the audience, everybody gave their best for the whole concern. Right. Yeah. And that's so rare. Yeah. It, that's uh, why it's so fabulous because we what, all just chipped in and it was like a fluid chaos that everybody decided well what can i do to help <laughs> you know and that's why we're still talking about woodstock i think and i just wanted to just exactly. quickly acknowledge quickly acknowledge that john morris is in the room and john was the production coordinator at woodstock <laughs> but also very people very few people know that he was also mc hi john can you hear us yeah i can hear you fine how are you man it's good hi, to see john. you Hi. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello. Uh, I was just going to tell you a quick story that when Sean and I went on, Eddie Goodgold, who was their manager, who was an old friend of mine, was furious because he said, the light's going to kill him. It's going to be awful. It won't work. And I said, go ahead and do it. And they did it. And it was wonderful. That's great. I think that was so, what was so great about Woodstock, Michael, is the lineup you know, choosing a diversified lineup. Um, how, did, was that intentional on your behalf? I mean, did you borrow a lot from, let's say, like Bill Graham, who who did that intentionally? I mean, he mixed his lineups up pretty good, you know, at the Fillmore, so. Well, the theme was the counterculture. So we were booking acts that were, you know, part of the counterculture and part of our lives. Uh, the only exception is the who who had nothing to do with what was going on in America and, you know, and were mods from England. Um, and I think, you know, had John not twisted their arms and got, gotten them to commit to play, I think they would have rather been at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but, but that was the theme. It was just, you know, it was, it was acts that we felt, you know, were the voice of the, of, of that, of our culture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, 
definitely was there. Um, so I was going to mention something to Jocko. Jocko, when I first met Jocko, the first thing he said was, to me when he realized I was writing um, the, uh, I have to plug this thing because it's, it's very difficult to do that during a pandemic, is The Last Seat in the House, the story of Hanley Sound, Bill Hanley's biography. Jocko said, Harold, turn up the mic. <laughs> he said it about 15 times. And I said, Jocko, <laughs> do, you know, do you know that Harold is a real guy that's still around? Harold, and there's the, the Harold story, the engineer, famously who worked for Bill uh, during Woodstock, that was so enamored by the sounds of sha -na -na, his favorite music, doo-wop, you know, this style of music, <laughs> that he forgot to adjust the levels. And to this day, Jocko, you told me that you say, Harold, turn up the mic at every... Sha Na Na concert that you perform. Yeah. Errol, turn up the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's so classic. It's so classic. Um, so, uh, Melanie, uh, Candles in the Rain, what, what, what did that song do for you to extend the Woodstock experience for your fans and, and your popularity? And did that springboard you like the, like the Crosby, Stills, Nash song uh, or the, even the Joni Mitchell tune? I you know, I don't know what springboarded me. I, I know that Woodstock, the whole performance was a catalyst for my career, you know, because at that point I was only really known in Europe. And um, I, in fact, I was in England before um, I came back to do it. And Peter and I were in the studio with, I mean, John Cameron and I was doing a movie score and I, I contemplated not going back thinking you know the maybe well you know I'm not such a big deal I it won't be so so I, I mean really it was just uh Peter actually stayed in England and I um came back myself and my mom picked me up and I I, I had no clue that this was a big deal I mean I really really did not until <laughs> until we hit traffic and um because it wasn't like instant everybody knew everything you know well, so well, um, my mom took me and then i was ushered to a helicopter and i told you the whole the, the fear kept mounting when i got when i got there richie havens was performing and i think he was in his like 40th minute of freedom <laughs> and i knew i knew he was in a, in this frenzy panic mode, you know, because he, he kept going on this, I think it was a motherless child and he just kind of went off on it with freedom, freedom. And um, I figured I'm probably next because I got it here on a helicopter. So it must have been, you know, time sensitive <laughs> or something <laughs> that I'm there. And so I, I mean, I was, about to go on from the second I descended uh, that field and all day long somebody would come and say you're on next and then they would say never mind you know <laughs> or else they didn't say never mind I just heard somebody else singing you know and then it I knew it wasn't me so it was this all day um, you know process and and right before I went on the rain started and I remembered some announcements. So somebody here tell me who was making that announcement about the candles and the rain. Do you know, Michael? Do you? It was probably John. What what day was it? Probably day right. one. Yeah, that was then it was John. That night. It was right? you? Ah, <laughs> uh, well there you go. And it, it absor I absorbed it, but I wasn't really listening. I was thinking I can go home now, you know, <laughs> and I won't have to do this. And I mean, I was sure this was my certain doom when I was going to get up there. I well, mean, let me ask I you, Melanie. guitar, me, and nothing uh, else. So I wasn't even a, a great guitar player. You know, I, I was more of a percussionist on the guitar. So when that, um, I actually had an out of body experience getting on that stage. It's one of those things that I don't talk about a whole, whole lot, but this is actually what happened. I left my body. And um, so I watched myself sit and I, it was all quiet. And then at some moment I was back and it was an epiphany, you know, and it was 
those four or 500,000 people got to see me have this experience, whether they knew what was happening or not. And I, I thought, this is, this is something I know. I am not just a body. This is, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual being. And um, yeah. that's, where, that's where Candles in the Rain came from. It was this powerful human connectedness that I sensed. Well, I mean, I guess my, or the origin of that question was, maybe I can direct it towards Michael, is like Monterey was the springboard for, uh, for you know, making acts more popular than they were at the time, unknown acts. So Jimi Hendrix, Janice, it brings to life. Do you think there's any one band in comparison to the Monterey Festival in, in that action that Woodstock could be accountable for? You mean like Santana? Yeah, just making someone, yeah, exactly, <laughs> like Santana, just making them, so but Santana would be the one for you that that really pronounced sent them well, like a rocket ship. Nash certainly got a boost. They certainly did. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, Everybody did, but that may be uh, Country Joe. Country Joe. That's we, true. Yeah, because he, he he told me that after Woodstock he was. He was banned, and he could only play in Europe. Right, yeah. Um, so. Chris Langhart, from a logistical standpoint, difficult to set up a, a festival, even Bill Hanley, uh, a festival on a muddy, on a muddy hill, or what, you know, things changed after Woodstock. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you plan, how does one plan to set up a city? Like a Wavy Gravy referred well, to, you, to them as a started. city. You notice that everybody's there and there needs to be a city. So you, you know, the medical, medical people already had the backfield in motion, but they were on mud, you know, so you put plywood under them and you get their tent up and, and then you go on to the next thing. Basically, John's wife, John Morse's wife, Annie, held, handled the logistics such, such as it was in my office because I'm too scattered rent it. Get that organized. I mean, I knew what was supposed to happen, but keeping track of all the bodies, that's something else. So I would go out to the front of the trailer every morning and there would be this whole bunch of people standing there and you would just look at them and try to decide which one seemed like they'd ever seen any construction before or was really earnest. And so you would just point at them and you do like six or 10 and then you had somebody who was in charge of that part of it and they would go off and do whatever, like putting pipes in the ground or whatever you've got material for. And then the next day, the same crowd would appear and you'd pick more, only every time you saw the crowd, you picked more and more and more. And so we started with six or seven and ended up with like 125 or 130 um, on payroll, just by adding and moving supervisors and changing things around and, you know, the Christmas tree lights would come, you know, you, you, you always, we had a purchasing department um, and, and uh, it was the gym, yeah. was the gym. Jeff from, from NYU. Yeah, and Jim. they, would stuff would arrive and that was the opportunity to start with another project and so you know normal worldwide we had all the christmas tree lights they had in new york and mm -hmm. needed to light a forest because i thought like putting street that, lights. that was jim mitchell yeah jim, jim mitchell. street lights in the forest was was really not on mm -hmm. so we put and that's when i learned that the army was right one person can only supervise about seven or twelve people because you get more than that, and they're like smoking joints instead of screwing Christmas tree bulbs in, even though it's the simplest, <laughs> dumbest job you could have. But, you know, you've got enough of it so that you can put lots of people to screwing light bulbs in for days on end and <laughs> stringing the wires up into the trees. But it made a magical thing visually, and that's what you needed. Yeah, uh, I'm always fascinated by the, 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 the forest behind Woodstock, the Bindi Bazaar area. That doesn't really get talked about much or examined much. Uh, but there were, I, do, I did hear from several people that there were Christmas lights strung up throughout there. I think, Bill, Bill Hanley, you might have some of those Christmas lights left over. And the, and the Christmas lights along the guy wires of the... Uh, right. whole, yeah, that right. was Chip. That was Chip, yeah. Okay, right, right, right. I want to acknowledge Joshua White is in the room of the Joshua Hi, Light Show. Hi, Joshua. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Joshua. <laughs> hey, Josh. It's a legendary panel hey, here. Turn the lights on, please. I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, or the Idaho. I don't think the I think the Joshua is muted. 
No, I think no. no he's oh, right there, there he goes. John Morris, I, I always remember this story, um, the the Iron Butterfly story. Can you yeah. can you can you tell us the Iron Butterfly story? Well, they just uh, called up and got us in the trailer, and said uh, you will have a helicopter waiting for us at LaGuardia. You will fly us to the site. We will go on instantly. Uh, we will then turn around and get the helicopter and fly back uh, to LaGuardia to fly to our next place. And I uh, got a lady at uh, Western Union uh, on the phone and we sent a telegram that said, for reasons uh, you will understand, uh, and then a C and then a K, and then a, so it spelled fuck you down. And uh, you couldn't do it any other way. And the lady was very cooperative. And that was the end of that. We never heard another word from her. Amazing. Well, that, 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 that's what happens when you write uh, Indigata Vida, I guess. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> um, Joshua White, you know, uh, again, all these hidden little uh, nooks and crannies of Woodstock. I don't like to cover the same stuff all the time about Woodstock and I'm sure you I hopefully you appreciate that uh, because you get asked it a lot but um, the Joshua Light show at Woodstock is something people don't know about in fact the, there was an attempt to have a light show at Woodstock so what happened well, what, what happened was it was a bad idea it's a bad idea <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a logical idea uh, because we were uh, working along the same design concepts that had been established in the previous two years uh but for uh for the light show there was no way we could have done it i mean it was simply totally out of scale i've come to learn this later in life and <laughs> the people uh who who were trying were trying uh but they had they had bitten off way more than they could chew and even if they had done a superb job and hung our 80 foot screen on time as promised we still would have had very little effect. Uh, the yeah. uh, whole idea was was wrong. We should have gone with video projection, which was something we'd been thinking about and we're, we're going to introduce into the light show. Imagine if Woodstock had video had projection. Before. It did. It had the video projector. Uh, we were going to mix it into the light show. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and we had three cameras, but once the screen was gone, we were dead. Yeah. <laughs> That's Even it. though I got the platform up for you guys, it's just the screen that was the killer. And that was it. That was it exactly. Everything was there. Wiped out the but I think the projector you had would not have been bright enough to do the job anyway. The technology just wasn't there yet. Well, it, it was bright. Projected. It would have been bright enough to suggest. Yeah, to suggest with and other it, things and around it. it. And we could have mixed it with light show, so it yeah. would have been that would have been an interesting experience for the the audience. And it's not like video not, projection like they have now. Right, uh, right. There's no way to begin uh, to discuss video projection the way they have now in terms of anything that affects us. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't out there. I mean, I went to my, I, that was the very next thing I did. After Woodstock, I was looking for something else to do. And it was going to be video projection because it was a good idea. Yeah. And, uh, and my initial idea was I'll, build, I'll do an electronic light show. I'll do it with video projectors and yeah. it'll be the same thing. But it wasn't, and I did it for a while, but then I got lucky in that television discovered how cheap rock and roll was to produce, and there I was with the skill set. So I'm, that's where my career went. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, of course, Bill Hanley, uh, this is you know why we're all brought together. We can't forget that uh, I wrote this book on Bill, his biography, and uh, a lot of these topics come up, video projection, all these innovations. Uh, leading up to Woodstock, of course, Woodstock being your culminating performance and sound reinforcement because it's noted as the largest uh, and most expensive sound system to be placed uh, at a, at a, in a rock and roll kind of arena setting or outdoor concert live venue setting. Um, but uh, Jock, I want to re go, I always like to refer back to the musicians because here you are, you're playing on a large stage and there's large speakers and your voice is in your band is being projected to thousands of people in these rolling hills. I mean, Jocko, for you, what was that like as a performer to be heard that in that way? I mean, here you are, you have the sound, the sound engineer of the sound system that you used in this manner. What, 
what, how does that affect you uh, from an artistic perspective? Were you well, impressed? it was remarkable that it was there and, re and it was also being recorded, which of course, you know, the film, when the film came out. But uh, I, we just knew that we were just very fortunate to one, get on and to have the capability of doing a great set. We we're actually a little too hyper. I think we were tired and, and exhausted. And this was, go ahead, you got 35 minutes, you're on, Sean. And, uh, <laughs> and it looked great. Uh, you know, we had the morning sun coming up, so it was pretty cool. And uh, it sounded great. And uh, we were just very fortunate to be there at that moment in time. Cool. I, I wanted to go just go back to the origins of, of Woodstock and how it all happened. And we don't have to cover the entire thing, but uh, the entire timeline. But uh, that was one of the most difficult parts of the last seat in the house was figuring out Bill Hanley's timeline as to when he might have been called for a sound brought in by Michael and Woodstock Ventures and basically began the idea of facilitating sound and, and all these things at the site. I did my best, but Michael, you appreciate this. This is this is from 1970, but it's a sound out poster oh. um yeah it's from 70 though uh but it's it's cool just to see the organic uh nature of the of the event and what it all meant to the community and and all that um yep. and then the for people this is just to educate educate the audience but this is the original uh david bird uh poster for Walville. Yep. and was this let me ask you michael was i say i teach a, an album art and poster art class uh, from time to time at the school I'm at, and um, we cover this poster because this poster, and actually David called in one time and he, he led a creative critique, which was very cool. Yeah. But this is a, this has like neoclassical kind of nudity. Was this, I, I always heard that there was a rejection of this poster, that there was some negativity about this there poster. Is that true? There wasn't, there wasn't a rejection of it really. And, and that was pretty typical of David's art at that time. Yeah. Um, but I think we wanted something that was more direct about what was what we were about, yeah. and uh, so we were looking around for somebody to uh, put it together to come up with an idea for it. And and John knew Arnold from a project he was doing in the Bahamas. Yeah, and um, so we brought him in, and I had described to him Dove on a guitar and three days of peace and music. And that's kind of what we were going with. And, and some diet and some, you know, some, some writing and, and the listening of the acts and, and uh, he went away and I think he thought we were all really weird because <laughs> <laughs> he was really straight laced and he was going to to that. And, and uh, he came back with this cutout. And it was the cutout of the bird on the guitar and, and three days of piece of music. And we all looked at it and collapsed. I mean, it was just perfect. perfect. Yeah, perfect. How do you, how do you beat that? Been, his daughter had been playing with uh, construction paper. That's and right. That's... Scissors. And he watched her for a while. And that's why he did it that way. He yeah. just took her construction paper. And I think one thing, too, that all of us, I think you're right, Michael, what happened was when he brought it in, we all went, oh yeah, this is it. And he was right on the money. Yeah. But David's was more of a classical Art Nouveau takeoff, and it just didn't say it. Art yeah. Nouveau. Too complicated. It was too complicated and too formal and, and, and yeah. not, didn't have the spirit. Really. Didn't have the punt, the that wonderful yeah. poster had yeah. so so michael um I, I i as a researcher and historian of this event and other things what truly inspired you to do woodstock was it the sound outs or was it uh the miami pop i mean or was it or was it an equal amount of both it was definitely inspired initially by monterey pop monterey pop yeah absolutely yeah I thought that was the coolest thing I could ever imagine. And, yeah. And it kind of evolved over that. And the sound outs were very kind of um, eye opening for me about what the setting should be. And the rest of it was really, you know, taken from what was going on at, 
at the time. It was, you know, we looked around and saw what was happening to our world and things were coming apart. And so we sort of looked at it as, you know, let's bring the tribe together and see if we can make it work on our own if we can't make it work in the streets. So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, one, thank you, Michael. Um, one of the things that yeah. came up a lot for me uh, in uh, putting this together was uh, who, who definitively found the site. Every, and the reason why it's not a petty thing really, because in, in that sense, it really doesn't matter. But it's just, I guess it's just something to talk about. Um, well, it does matter because that was the site to be chosen, but uh, who found it really is irrelevant. Uh, but who, I, I, I read the books and I read the research and each of that story is different. I, you know, I'm the person that found it. I came upon it first. So Tisha was one. And it's funny because every time I researched, had researched Tisha, Tisha you were in Exeter. I'm in new, uh, in new market right next to Exeter. So we're, we were close kind of neighbors and I, I, called you up and you were around and we, ch we chatted about it. So I went with Tisha's take on who found the site. Uh, what, what, what do you remember about finding the site? And when I, and when I asked you, you said, well, it was the 1960s. Everybody found the site, right? It was that sort of thing, but. Well, it wasn't. Well, it was, it was, it was, it was, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, when, when Elliot called me at the office um, and said they had permits and they wanted us, I called Michael and he picked me up and we went right up to this swamp that Elliot had. And we met Mel and there. So, the hotel. And, and we, well, we didn't meet, we we didn't met, meet Mel until after we went and looked. You know, when we saw that it wasn't the right thing, we drove around. Yeah, but Mel and was with us then. No, he wasn't. Because yeah, he, he was. me out of the car. Mel, Mel and I. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. This is it right here. This is, and this is why I bring it up. It's like I need Mel, to be pro I need to be proven that I'm not a, a, a shitty historian, but in fact, no, no. My <laughs> memory is really I'm not clear. Senile. Listen it's, to it's really the way clear. I see. Let, let me tell you the story. All right. Okay. Is, Mike, Michael goes first. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, which is that we went up, we met Mel at <laughs> Motel from Hell. <laughs> Mel, yes. Mel and I walked into the field that he was purporting to be a site for the festival, and then Mel sort of dropped out of sight, step, you know, falling into a hole of water. Uh, and <laughs> then, then we went back up the hill to the office. Mel was going to kill Elliot. For bringing him up for this insane. <laughs> the permit they had was for a little theater group that was rehearsing in a barn on his property. Oh my God. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we got, so I said to Elliot, is there somebody who could show us around? Because we were passing beautiful farms on the way. It was gorgeous. And I can't remember the guy's, the realtor's name, but he picked the, he picked all, all of us up, Tisha and, and Mel and I, and we went riding around. A in Abraham, was it Abraham? Abraham. Uh -huh. Abe, um, I'll, oh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I can't remember. No. Hey, Michael, let me just interject this to see if yes. it jogs your memory. Yeah. So we got to your white Porsche and you said, let's just drive up the road for a minute because we were waiting for that guy to come. And we saw Happy Avenue and I was saying, listen, we're leaving Wall Kill. It's a terrible name. And look, there's Happy Avenue. Let's take that that jog. So we that, 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 we went on Happy Avenue. I like that. I like, I like I mean, that story. Not, I like that story better because it doesn't it, involve a lawyer. I was going to say it's 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 a nice thought. <laughs> and it has no lawyers. There's no but lawyers there was, involved. But there was nothing Legit. that was going to stop us from getting to the motel first. No, we went there first. Yeah. It was and from we, the motel and, and then on that little Mel. ride. And then we met And Mel we went the back ride. to the motel. You got Mel and dropped me at the motel. And you then went back to Yasger's farm, which you and I had seen. And we, you went with Mel. I, di I, didn't, to I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't drive with Mel. I, we got into the car that belonged to the realtor. Right. That's and what I realtor, mean. You went 
Yeah. And the first time we saw that field was from that car. Oh, God. It's, I can't believe <laughs> Well, this is just, we'll, we'll, we'll stop here. Perfect. <laughs> we could go, we could go way, on and on. Yeah, we could go on and on. Way, it's perfect. Well, yeah, right. It's, well, this is, and Bill, of well, course. With that, yeah, I go just ahead, want Melanie. To say, if I, I, I've been performing nonstop ever since I performed at Woodstock. And every per time I'm, I'm in a theater or a, a concert venue, there'll be hundreds of people who say they saw me at Woodstock. Now, I figured if all the people who remembered going to Woodstock <laughs> and seeing me, and actually, if that was really true, we, we could start a small country, you know? <laughs> it was, I mean, people's memories, it's a very funny thing about them, yeah, you know? Yeah. And um, right. so I believe everything. Right. <laughs> I just, you know, a Michael story is, also, is, is, is great. They might have seen you in the movie. What? what? They might have seen you in the Oh, no. The movie, oh, they oh, probably, right. yeah, they probably saw the movie. Right. So yeah. then they, they but, saw you on the on oh, I didn't, I didn't think I was in the, in the movie. movie. <laughs> I think I was in the second movie. I wasn't in the first one. Yeah, that's right. That's right. J Joshua, oh. Joshua White. Who would have thought it would be me? You know? <laughs> Joshua White, uh, <laughs> so you, your 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 screen doesn't go up. That doesn't happen. Uh, what do you do during the festival? During the do you are you assigned another role? Or you just walk around and kind of party. And, yeah, and no, you, not, not none of the above. We uh, what you do? We well, we did. We spent all our effort for the set first few days, including the opening night, setting up, and <clears throat> we accepted the screen as it was eventually hung, which was all with holes in it to keep the air from blowing it away. Right. And then when dawn came, we went back to our motel and we came back at twilight and no screen. So that we packed it. up and we went home and that was that. That was it. Yeah, because you can see the screen in the earlier shots. That's of, right. Of the first stuff, night, yeah. first night, first night. But again, this was, uh, this this was uh, I was uh, much angrier and much more of a hothead then. Yeah, of but, course. Uh, uh, but uh, but it was a disappointment. But uh, but it it didn't take me long to realize that we never should have been there. And as I said, to regret that I didn't just say, "Hey, let me just do video projection," because yeah. any video projection would have worked. Right. And and I would have done it with my with my light show people. It was so simple to do. Yeah. Um, but we just. Uh, we just didn't we didn't have that foresight we've been experimenting with it thanks to bill and yeah. we've done it at the fillmore uh and it was great and I, I just but you know it it came and it passed and uh sure uh but what what i did do because i really physically in doing the light show didn't have um a lot to do either in setting up or taking it down except to supervise i stood on that platform above yeah. the back of the stage and i watched everything the fans yeah. the Thing for for two days and that yeah. was spectacular. I'll never forget that. Well, you know something. Even though the Joshua White, Joshua Light Show wasn't at Woodstock, it doesn't really matter because your the impression that you've made on a culture uh, and a and a and a very significant time in music with your light shows stays with us. Even if you you know when you close your eyes and think mm -hmm. of this music from this era, we can see your. Your light show, man. You know, oh, it's it, right. oh yeah. Please, you know. and, and, and I just I just want to make make it clear that I yeah. was uh, very disappointed uh, when when the, when the light show didn't. Uh, sorry, it's, it's okay. The singing and dancing of my computer. I was very I was very sorry when uh, I, I got a new telephone. And, who is that? Is that you? It's my no. sisters, but they're just gonna have to decline. Wait, decline. God. Decline. Hang on, wait, decline. All right, I had to no, mute John Kane. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, when I was in New York uh, with one of these colloquiums, yes. and uh, Michael was there also, yes. it came up, uh, someone asked, how was Hanley picked for the job? Because yes. it never occurred to me, having been with Hanley all the time, that there was any other possibility for somebody to do it. But when it yes. was pointed out, that it could have been Osley and the Dead's people. I thought, well, yeah. yes, in fact, yeah. they could have done it. I don't yeah. know that it would have been the same scene, but I thought it was interesting that Michael had that as a balancing point of the choice of him. I did. I I, I was considering Osley and 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 Bill when when we met, 
And, you know, Owsley had been known for the biggest outdoor systems, working with the dead at that point in time. Uh, but he, you know, as everybody knows, he was also the largest producer of LSD in America. <laughs> <laughs> so we went with the safer choice, which was Bill. <laughs> Who didn't produce as much LSD? As <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one thing the that system was better. <laughs> working, reading Bill's book, uh, Bill and John's book, which I've been doing recently. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Woodstock owes so much to the clarity of Bill's sound, to the fact that we were able to communicate. I mean, and it never, it never uh, failed. It never absolutely. failed. Yeah, absolutely, it was miraculous. If we had not communicated the way we it were, it would have been a whole different thing. And the whole image of everybody's mind about Woodstock is from the movie, because we were there, but we also got us got to see the movie later. Uh, I can't say. I mean, I didn't thank you 50 years ago, Bill, but I thank you now for providing some communication. Uh, a possibility if we didn't have it, we'd have been in real deep trouble. That, that's, go ahead, Bill, did you want to say something, sir? No. Okay. No. You just started taking it all in, like, yes, no. yes, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me no lies. All right, Michael wants to say something. Go ahead, let me Michael. Say this about that. If you look at the pictures of how much equipment was up on those sound towers, and then you look <laughs> at any, any outdoor show today, and you see the difference in the amount of reinforcement, it is incredible that it works so well that you could hear everywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was remarkable. When you, you know, you look at it from today's point perspective, it was amazing, I think. The little Very stick was designed to push way to the back. I know. It narrow yeah. it down yeah. vertically. And I made yeah. a special that they wouldn't come out of the place where we built them. So we had to take the windows. But it, but it, was, it was everything else. Just this I did see. the. The open tubed Macintosh amplifiers it, under a scaffolding protected by blue tarp. You know, the, the, the bill all alone on a scaffold in the middle of that crowd, just standing there. You know, I didn't see any intercom system. I don't know, even know how you did that, you know. Uh, and, and very few microphones, if I understand, very few actual available microphones. About 15 to 18. We had Compared to modern day, which yeah. we never took out because we, as soon as the turntable failed, right, uh, which, was, which was immediate, immediate, you know. right? No, actually, it lasted a day and a half. Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 really? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, you're the authority. I just uh, it, was was my, once. It, it was my idea, so I have to take full responsibility for it. <laughs> Now the idea was a perfectly good idea, which which got used for uh, for years um, uh, and continues to be used. And I used it in television. It was the execution. Yeah, it was the wheels. Oh, oh it was not the wheel itself. <laughs> it was the it was the fact that someone brought forgot to bring washes for the bolts. <laughs> to go through to attach the wheels and they yep. were off center axis. Yep. And that's why it failed. Then they pulled right straight through as soon as it was loaded and I up. Think, and I think it was the dead that broke it. That's what I heard. Yeah, the yeah. weight, and, the and, weight and, of their equipment. Yeah. Well, I, think, I also think they're, if, if you're gonna nail that, that particular honor on somebody that did, <laughs> it just add all it does is add i you know if you stick it on richie havens it's not the same thing add, well, add no more. but but it it was a design fault also because for a caster to change direction it has to have lead and it goes around like this when you push the turntable and there was no accommodation for that in modern day situations they put tri casters they put a triangle on you and there's three casters so when the thing goes the other direction the, the, the little mini turntable under the wheels can turn and that allows all the other wheels to get twisted around so they're all going the same way. So when these wheels were trying to move, they would twist and some would be at an angle and some would be this way and that way. And by the time it all got going the same way, um, there was a lot of strain on the plate and it pulled the, pulled the screws right through the thing. I'm not sure washers would have done it. Um, Michael Lang, had you seen that done at another concert before or festival, the, uh, the, the rotating half moon? Uh, uh, kind of the tra transfer station of uh, the theatrical transfer of, of equipment oh, on stage? No more. Yeah. No, you did I it at the film? 
I'd never seen that that done before. Oh, but the, but that was a that was a that's stand, a theater thing. That was, that was standard theatrical thing. The yeah, yeah. Nicole has a stunning turntable. Rolling even rolling props in and out, right? Oh. Of, of, yeah. yeah. Okay. You got to deal with directionality with casters, at least the older ones. Well, we now were, we know. <laughs> we were just very we were just very concerned about the change over times. Yeah. So so I thought you know the three halves of a pie idea would work. Yeah. Uh, and and you know when it worked it worked fine yeah then it didn't work at all and <laughs> <laughs> well i i asked chipmunk to participate in this and he said uh he said thank you very kindly and the most chipmunk voice i could ever perform and he said but i'm all woodstock out <laughs> yeah, I'm, and, I'm, all, I'm all paneled out too but i made an exception for you guys no oh, thanks thanks joshua oh, joshua <laughs> joshua you're in my book man i throw you i, I throw I you mean, props I, man I thought, I thought i was obligated but i also wanted to say <laughs> that, that that my uh my hostility towards uh towards the whole woodstock uh experience was uh, that dissipated really very quickly and i sure. and i just and and, and mike uh, uh we had uh, a mutual friend the late lee bloomer who got a great deal of pleasure out of out of uh, 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 stirring that pot? But I, yes, I like I like you, and I never and I never didn't like you. <laughs> so so I just like it, and, and I was very disappointed when the last uh, the last time uh, you tried it, the fiftieth anniversary. I I was very disappointed that that just couldn't come yeah. off. So Me thank too. you for trying. It, that that would have been great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Bill. You use that same system or similar similar system at West Palm Beach Pop, so it continues oh, on yeah. side to side, side to side. Not so a cart system side to side. Right. Not you didn't have the problem that Chris just explained so well about the wheels changing direction. Plus, the yeah. plate at the top of those casters was very small, and it was right off center. And when it loaded up. It just pulled right straight through. Yeah. And, and Jocko, did you notice, acknowledge any of the, the technical goings on around you as you're waiting to take your, your set and you perform? Did you, do you Harold, remember? Harold, turn up the mic. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Find Harold. <laughs> well, I'm just curious because this is a, this is a, a, well, a, a point, a threshold where popular music and technical efficiency and standardization uh, an operational standardization for fe festivals and concerts start to kind of intersect. So we, just, we thought it was like a miracle after going through the Sunday rains and the stage sinking and the mud that mm -hmm. this thing was still on at all. And the fact that we could get out there on a dry stage, equipment worked. We had an old Willis or piano which we've had up in the museum up in uh, Woodstock. And that was nicely out of tune. So we were, we were fighting <laughs> to decide which notes we wanted to take to set the harmony. But you know what? It all worked out. Yeah, totally. Man. Harold, turn up the mic. <laughs> I love that story. Um, Michael Lang, Har uh, Chip tells me that, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not, but this is a, a story he told me that um, when we see Joe Cocker on stage performing in the film, of course, very edited down performance, uh, that he's all wet looking. And he goes, you know why he was all wet looking, right? He said, well, I said, no, I, I don't sweat, you know, I don't know. And he, he said, someone took a knife, attached it to the end of a board and stuck it through the canopy of that failing roof structure where water was pooling. And he oh. said, some idiot jammed a knife, slid it, and down comes water, you know, pouring, <laughs> showering down on Joe Cocker. Is that true? I, I like that story a lot, but is it a you true know, story? You remember I like that, story? that story a lot too. And I, I remember the, the ripping of the canvas. I don't remember falling on Joe, but it's quite possible because he always told me that, that uh, as he was walking off stage and he was soaking wet, he looked at the, at the clouds and saw this unbelievable storm coming. And he said, did I do that? <laughs> 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 and, and with what you're saying that. maybe he did <laughs> i love that i love that uh john morris we were talking earlier about well one thing you told me that and we've read this in uh in woodstock myth and lore that some of the first words or the first words at woodstock was holy shit 
<laughs> right? I don't think that's true. We, Chris and uh, the rest of us had gone out to eat some dinner, and it took us about three hours to get back. I walked up on stage, and Bill was testing the sound system, and I happened to stand in front of the live mic, and I looked out into the field and broke my promise to my mother that I would never swear on stage. That's incredible. And you, you know, in the book, I talk about, of course, the significance of the sound system for music, but you are, you were an MC and uh, there's, again, not every chipmunk takes the credit for that, gets a spotlight for it. But I, I know that you were also MCing as well. And that the sound system wasn't just a conveyor of music, but the sound system was also a conveyor of oral speech, meaning people hearing the words from that stage the projections of those messages actually affected the crowd emotionally like music would. My point being is there are people very much in that audience that had social anxiety or had anxiety of crowds, but the fact that we had a functioning sound system that could connect the people, the, the, the messages from the stage to the audience made them feel better. I've talked to audience uh, people, attendees that have said that to me because I've asked that question. You, you know, know side, side, go ahead, Michael. The truth is that that without a stage to be in those days, because there were no cell phones or anything else, it was the only way to communicate with everybody. And if we had not had that, it would have been chaos. And, and I didn't realize until I was reading Bill's book how specifically important that was. Oh, yeah. It was critical. It was critical. It was I mean, because you could just pick up a mic and you could say what you had to say yeah. and they could react to it. Had we not had that, we'd have been dead. Yeah, and it was just, you know, and it sort of gave everybody this sense of being in the same family. I mean, the, the way you would talk to the crowd through those storms, John, was amazing. Um, you know, and, and Chips, you know. He had a more formal way of going you, about it than John did. A neat way of, de but, but dealing with them as adults, you know, which is what that really brought because of the way he talks. Um, I think- but I thought John's was very, frank and honest and yeah. direct and that made it more homey and helped us solidify I think it was just a great John, John, just John a great had, mix yeah john had the, had the gift had this gift of gab I, I because you gotta remember we're talking about about dozens and dozens of hours when there's nothing happening and the right. only thing that's gluing this together is the sound system which did not fail uh, and 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 uh, Chip was uh, was very formal and had this wonderful kind of pomposity that we all enjoyed. It was very funny. John John could stand on the stage in his um, in his those shoes without the socks, the the cloth shoes that that were were worn by people yeah. who spent, spent time in the Caribbean, and he would. Uh, he would tell the audience about a resort that he and his old college roommate were opening up in St. Thomas. And they would just be enthralled. And he would go on and on about this. Uh, and he just had the gift. He had the gift of entertaining uh, and, and oh, all this. You know, the reason that we went from John to Chip was that John had lost his voice. And so I went up to him and I said, John, you got to stop. You're, you know, you're, you're going to get sick. You're, you're, you can't even speak. And he just didn't want to go anywhere. I mean, he was just, you know, so resistant and because he was so into it. Um, but that's how we made the switch to Chip. Yeah, interesting. We had a thing, actually, the, the way the whole thing started was we'd booked a couple of uh, New York radio DJs. And on Friday, they started out with, hey, groovy guys and girls, here we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Michael and Chip and everybody else, we just went, uh-uh, got to get rid of this. And we fired them on the spot. Right. And uh, sorry, I've got allergies for being in New Mexico. It's okay. And it sounds a little like Lauren McCall. But <laughs> sorry, uh, man. It was, that was what started it. And I remember on Sunday, there was a, an usher, and I can't find his name. And I can't remember it at all, but his, he was called Mole. And Mole said, showed up with a handful of Sunday newspapers and said, can I read the comics to the kids? And Fiorello and Guardia, when he was the mayor of New York, used to read on Sunday mornings on the radio, the comics to the kids. 
Yeah. And Mole, I still have the vision of Mole sitting in a chair with a mic, telling everybody what the comics were. And I'd love to find the guy. Because he was just another one of those people who just did it. Mole, Mole, if you're listening. Where are you? <laughs> um, I, I, when I see pictures of Woodstock, because that's really what I have reference to. Of course, the film is a point of reference. Uh, but I was, I was just looking at some new pictures. Uh, David Marks, um, uh, one of Bill's crew members, has a wonderful collection of, of uh, Woodstock pictures. But, you know, from, from straight on, obviously, uh, on Monday morning, straight on, the, the rain had hammered that stage, it hammered the ground, the crowd. Um, the, the roof structure was just flapping. It was, the picture caught it like mid-flap. You know, this thing was just a, a mess. Um, Which I might add, Chip and Steve Cohen designed. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, right. Well, Chris Langhart, maybe you could speak. What happened what? to the roof structure? Or Bill, what happened to that what, roof? What happened to the roof structure is that... Uh, when they left Walk Hill, someone went around the corner with the poles sticking on this trailer out the back. The poles that hold, were holding up the roof. Right, they broke off 20 feet of pole. And that's why the poles were too short. Because they, instead of, if they asked me at the time, I didn't know what happened until later on, until Steve asked me to consult it with me about it. And you could have attached the broken off piece back on the post and it would have worked. Jackers tape. But it, it didn't happen. And I didn't I was, I was never consulted throughout the entire thing because when Michael had his original competition to determine what the stage should look like, I, I created something which was completely crazy and unrelated to what his thought was. And I didn't appreciate that it was nothing like what he had in mind because I had not met him before and didn't understand where he was coming from. So I had something that was more reminiscent of the AL ice rink and it was modern and curved and had nothing to do with what he had in mind. And so I was persona non grata on the stage and that's why the Joshua Light Show platform was supported from the ground separately from the stage with a wholly different structural arrangement because yeah. it was part of my plate to deal with Joshua Light Show platform yes, somehow. Exactly. And exactly. so it got put up. Which, which, you, which, which we, the we, never, we never let us forget, but we still appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, you were the man. Chris, did they, they leave the those poles? Wait, 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 wait Tisha, 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 go ahead. What, did you, what were you saying? I just wondered if they left the poles that got broken off on the side of the road or if they brought them up. To the they side. brought the same post up, but, but they broke it off at uh, leaving Walk Hill, going around the trees and on the site. Did they bring that as well? Or did they, they brought them from the other site? That's how, that's how they got in trouble. So you want to know if they right. brought the broken piece? The broken oh, piece? Yeah. I, don't know, I have no idea. I didn't know what happened until. Well, it was a very bad design. It put a tremendous amount of weight in those beams above Loading. the stage. Uh, and I can tell you that standing underneath it in the storm with that stuff flapping around was not the most comforting thing in the world. No, the trusses were, the trusses were definitely oversized. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, and, and <laughs> if, if the post were a lot longer, it would have been all right. Even, well, I'm not sure because you've got these, these lines coming in in triangles to support each each tri one triangle from each side to do each truss. And as you did that, um, the loading on the poles was different depending on which truss was put in first. So it was a, it's a problem of, of dynamic loading when you're, I mean, once the thing was done, and it's like a model, if you can hold them all there while you put the strings on, then it works great. But the, the intermediate part where the balance is not correct, that's a tricky business. And I don't think they had it well thought out. Uh, and, and it didn't help any that the poles were different heights. <laughs> um, that the poles were different heights. And of course, the cranes couldn't do much well, about it because the by the time the crane got parked, it couldn't move because it was bodies all around the thing. The poles were in a different height. They cut off the long post pole <laughs> to get, make them the same length. So they well, were the same length. We, 
we could save this for another show. The the the, the Woodstock, uh, yeah, totally. But I, I wanted I wanted I wanted to get I wanted to get some que- I wanted to get to, to some questions. And I, and I wanted to mention because I just received a text from Wavy's manager Mark that Wavy has been trying desperately to connect, but he's having uh, uh, t- technical Wi-Fi wi-fi issues so wavy says sorry you'd love to be here and um we love yeah. wavy gravy man uh the legend and they've been turning off our electric oh really okay here. yeah i don't yeah. know what the re- i don't know what the, the reason heat. is but i wanted yeah. to John, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to split in a couple of minutes all right man sorry. totally michael really michael it's been I great want- to see everybody love you guys and happy anniversary I love happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. And everybody Bye. wish Chris a happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Oh, happy, happy birthday, Chris birthday. Langer. Happy birthday. Oh, good to have Michael on. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Bye, Thank guys. you, man. Thank you, man. Peace, dude. Well, I, a couple my, more. My, uh, my favorite story, there seems to be, it was somebody who found what he referred to as the original Woodstock stage. Yes. And was selling pieces of it like it was the true cross, uh, you know, a, a, as jewelry and and I don't know what else. Okay. I thought that was that was uh, that was I think the most outrageous. Fifty years yeah. later, they're selling pieces of the original stage. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now Melanie and Jocko, there was a a, a re-release or a, a a launch last year of the all the the entire recordings of Woodstock. Mm-hmm. Um, were you part? Were you part of that? Did you hear your set in that uh, box yeah. set, or what? Yes, I, I was um, yeah. never um, consulted. Okay. <laughs> Somehow, I have never made a penny on Woodstock. Okay. Um, I, 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 it's away. a serious human rights issue <laughs> with me, and um, I'm addressing it. But yeah, uh, the point is that. Um, I'm uh, not, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, you don't have to go into it. I was just curious if you're tired. I have to, I have to look, but there's. No, I was, I, I don't, I didn't know I did a set. I, you know, I went on, I didn't have a set list. I was going with the flow, you know, and yeah. uh, the flow was that I left my body and then I came back and I'm singing beautiful people and 500,000 people are with me yes. and connecting with me and it was it was so outrageously magical and mystical and that's the story i bring back with me when i'm remembering yeah. you know when i'm remembering mm-hmm. i remember how i felt i don't remember the details yeah you know i don't remember all the details if i do i'm probably making them up you know because um what really happened was what was being felt and it was being felt by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways and um so my uh experience and what what the packages have been and what has come out of it is um it's very disconnected to my actual experience right because i I was I have this feeling of, of what happened. Yeah. And so my story and my recollections are probably a lot different. I certainly don't remember anything about the polls. <laughs> I, don't, I have no thoughts about the polls. Well, why would, why would you, right? Um, it's interesting, you know, it, all I know is the sound was beautiful yeah. because that I, I connect very strongly with my voice, you know? Yeah. And when I was singing, I felt, I felt I could do anything through my voice. You know, the sound was beautiful and perfect. And that is the reason I'm sitting here right now. That's right. Just to pay my respects. Yeah, cool. And Melanie, are you, work, are you working on anything new, Melanie? Before we, we end this panel, are you working on anything new? Are you working on anything? I'm working on everything. I'm working on new songs. I have something that's just so, so excited about. Um, we're uh, right, you know, I've been writing, I've been writing with my son and we're recording and we're gonna be, I have a cuckoo clock. <laughs> I know exactly how many hours we've been here now. Um, so I, um, I mean, and I'm 
you know, waiting to, uh, you know, I wasn't much of a drug person during Woodstock. I'm probably the only person who was oh. there who wasn't stoned or altered in some way. I waited till 2020 for the altered reality to set in, you know, 2020, this is the ultimate altered reality. I agree with you. Jocko, not to miss you know, out on your, your um, performance. Michael, your Michael and I oh, both didn't take any drugs at Woodstock. Really? Amazing. Neither did I. Yeah. Couldn't, yeah. I, I want to <laughs> make sure it kept going. I wanted to ask Yeah, how could, I, yeah I, well, I wanted to ask. Have, uh, functioned. I wanted to ask Jocko uh, about your performance at Woodstock. Jocko, did you have you like Melanie? Have you shared that same kind of thing where you mis haven't seen yourself show up on certain compilations, or like there was a compilation last year of music that came uh, came out? So, yeah, I I think we knew at the time. Yeah. That we signed our life away in terms of Woodstock. Yeah. We got, I think we got a check for $350 and that bounced. But we understood immediately, especially <laughs> well, film came. that and it did not bounce. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. For sure. that it didn't bounce. This was an important thing. We were, we were a, a young new group. This is only our eighth or ninth performance in public. Sure. That what that gave us in terms of marketing, you couldn't ask for, you couldn't even imagine than being in, you know, the 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 film. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're very grateful for everybody who's there that made this all work and for in and for being invited to, to be on the stage. Yeah, right on. And are you working on anything new, Jocko? I have Wear a Mask. It's on YouTube by Jocko. And uh check it out and it's obvious what it's about, but Check it out if you. And Joshua White, you, I see. You, I'm your friend on Facebook. I see you got a lot of stuff going on, a, a lot. So tell us what you're doing, man. Well, actually, I'm sitting at home. I, I've been home for the past five months, and I'll probably be home for the next five months. Give me yeah. a call, everybody. Uh, the the uh, uh, there was a show that was created in Los Angeles called Bill Graham and the Rock and Roll Revolution, which follows his story. It's a museum installation. It follows his story from being. A Holocaust survivor to uh, to to uh, San Francisco and to the Fillmore and eventually to his death. Um, and the Joshua Light Show is very prominent in it because when he came to New York, it went from he went from being a local producer of dance concerts to a impresario who did amazing things in the Fillmore East. And I did that with Chris and Bill and John. And, uh, and this show is at the New York Historical Society, and they will be reopening soon. Cool. And uh, it's great, and the Joshua Light Show is represented in it, and we have been uh, doing interviews and just having a good time. That's awesome, man. I got to make it out to that. Um, anybody else working on anything new they'd like to plug, or any lasting memories of Woodstock that you'd like to, to share as we wrap up? Well, I occasionally mention it when I'm... Uh, coming through class because Silbury School knows that, you know, the various kiddies have figured out that that's the thing that, that I'm known for. And, uh, but I'm no longer working in the drama department uh, to do all the carpentry for their shows. I mean, I'm in and out, but not in a big way like I used to be. But, uh, you know, they say, you know, when the door opens and the window closes, vice versa, why, it turns out there's a place in the next town over, uh, French town where there's this new operation called Art Yard and they had a gallery in a Butler building and they were talking about what kind of theater they might have there okay. and I went to a meeting with the architect and the entrepreneur and listened to them all discuss how they were going to stick this auditorium into this Butler building and uh, finally I said I, I listening to what you want to do I don't think this is going to fit in there uh, in a reasonable way, but, you know, you can carry on trying, but, you know, I, I don't, it just doesn't seem to me like the right thing. And I went, I wasn't officially invited to this meeting. I went off from the meeting and like a couple of weeks later, the entrepreneur calls me up and says, well, we've decided to buy the building down the street and we're going to tear it all down and have built a whole theater and, a, and, a, and a, an art museum, a whole new building, with more space for the art museum and a, and a kind of a maker space and one thing or another. And I thought, well, who would have thought? And uh, so we're still working on that with the architect and builders and it's a totally new building. 
Cool. Joe, anybody else want to plug something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yes. I have a vinyl, a vinyl coming out of a concert that I did in 1974 in England, live at the Drury Lane Theater. And I got to perform with um, the Incredible String Band. Wow. They were guests of mine. And um, yeah, they were, the irony is that I took their place at the original, um, at the, at Woodstock because uh, what I was told, what I was told anyway, was that they didn't want to go on because it had, it was raining and they were afraid of electrocution and I didn't know anything about electric. So I, I was just, go you know, ahead. <laughs> on. and, uh, and, and four years later, they were on stage with me. They, they were my favorite group at the time, the Incredible wow. Street Band. That was my absolute favorite group. And how now we have a vinyl coming out um, uh, cool. any Congra- minute. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, more, more can be found out on your website, and I'll share yeah, that yeah. with folks. So I wanted to just say something before we all split, that Wait, in order... Mar- what's John Morris? Oh, John, John, what's up? What are you up to, sir? Oh, I'm like Joshua. I'm putting my time in and waiting for the COVID to go away. I know. Waiting for the elections to come up and then uh, get rid of this idiot and uh, try to put the world back together. Uh, actually, David Dolphsinger is here and said hi to everybody, to Hanley and Langhart. And uh, I cool. wanted to ask Melanie one thing if she remembered. Melanie actually got me banned from the Albert Hall in London. Do you remember that, dear? No, I didn't do that. We, yes, it was you. We did you in the Albert Hall in London. This is back 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, you had a, an oriental rug you were sitting on, and you invited the audience to come up and join you. And they did. And that freaked out the Albert Hall, and they put a ban on me. I couldn't do it. Wow, that. wow. That freaked out a lot of people. But when audience, but audiences just did that, and no. I had no control. It wasn't your fault. I don't fault you. I don't fault. I mean, I fault them because they were stupid. <laughs> but I just want to throw one last word in here again about having finished the book. I'll do the plug for your book, John. Okay, thanks, man. Uh, I just went back to it and read it again, and we've all had the pleasure of working with somebody who sometimes we think of as just a just another solder gun. Uh, we ought to gild a solder gun and give it to you, uh, Bill. But Bill put him, has put himself out there in so many ways over the years. And it's something you should be proud of, man. And I'm proud to have known you. And I thank you for saving our ass at Woodstock. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, do you guys, do you guys have yeah. a minute? Thank you, John, very much. Very, very appreciate it. Do you guys have a... Tisha, what are you up to? What are you up to? Trish. Tisha. Well, basically, I'm, I'm gardening right now, and I'm a hermit, but uh, I have been writing um, a book about a journey to Woodstock, and um, I'm on the Woodstock part now, so we'll see if it ever gets finished. Cool. And do you guys have a moment just to hear some comments from people? And I, I think there might be a couple of questions, but do you, does anybody have to split right this second or what? No, I'd love to hear comments. Okay, all right, it won't take very much. And I want to apologize to the audience because we do have people watching, but in order to engage you and put all my energy in, into you all and listen to you, it's it's difficult to also have to go back to the technology and sift through it and, and get on. I really should have a an assistant or someone here funneling the questions and all, but I don't have that. So I want to apologize to anybody that had a question previously or made a comment. It's not because I don't think you're, you're worthy of that or I'm ignoring you. It's just because I'm, I'm not, I'm a multitasker, but that's nearly impossible to, to split it right down the middle. So let me see here. Um, let's see. And I want to make some acknowledgements. Um, Larry Bazinski's in the room. Hi, Larry. Thank you for listening in. Uh, yes, Larry, this was just a Woodstock panel. Uh, it wasn't a, 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 you know, some people get confused that they can join the Zoom panel, but this is just to be streamed on Facebook. Um, and thank you for watching. Someone asked Mike Lang to, to that if any of those rental cars they lost during the festival ever turned up. Can anybody answer that, John Morris? <laughs> we rented 22 cars yep. from a company called Alexander Rent-A-Car. Oh. 
And at the end of the festival, I think they sent people up there. They found one at the bottom of a lake. And oh. as far as I know, they've never found the others. And Alexander read a car, went out of business. Wow. They went out of business and the furthest car that was discovered was somewhere in Canada. Um, wow, wow, really? That's incredible. <laughs> That's good. I love I love little details like that. That's amazing. Just uh, I think Alexander's rent a car was part of the department store. They just went. No Ama more. Amazing. Okay. Uh let's see. Uh Mark uh is Wavy's manager. He's saying, Where's Wavy? This is way back. Sorry, Wavy again, Wavy Gravy was supposed to be here tonight. He's he's here in spirit. We can feel his energy. The he's a power he's a powerful human being and we know he wants to be here. I can feel it. We love Wavy Gravy. Greatest. He's the greatest, man. Uh, so, Greg Heimson. Hi, Greg. How are you? Greg's a big fan. Greg worked on the Wavy film, uh, Saint Misbehaving. I recommend everybody uh, watch that wonderful documentary. Uh, we have some Woodstock attendees here saying hello. We have the sister of Alan Wilson, uh, uh, blind, Alan Blind Owl Wilson. Janie is in the room. She says hello to everybody. Uh, Alan Can't Heat, of course, you know, the... Uh, uh, the wonderful band Canned Heat. Would you, any any run-ins with Canned Heat guys? Any personal, any stories with, with the Canned Heat band? John Morris, Melanie, you guys know? I was on the road with them in Italy. Cool. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> okay, okay. All done. We're done there. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, someone says... Oh, uh, let's see here. Hi, Bill. Do you remember... Wait a second. No, that's not it. Um, let's see here. Hello, hello. Happy anniversary. I'm going down the list here. Um, let's see. Next to 24th. Uh, fortunate to attend the Long Island Music Hall of Fame induction ceremony in 2018. Melanie and Michael Lang were inducted. Um, so they say hello to you, Melanie. Uh, hello to Joshua White, the magnificent Joshua Light Show, people acknowledging that. Happy anniversary, almost done. Um, oh, uh, someone asked Bill Hanley, did you split the audio feed for the movie soundtrack? Split every microphone. Every microphone was split. Robin Ellis asked that question. Um, yay, someone says, yay, John Morris. Yay, Chris Langhart. Um, Everybody, people say thank you very much. Thank you for all your talent and contributions to everyone on the panel uh, in this historic event that will live on forever and continue to teach the world peace, love, unity, and music. Um, yeah, so we're still talking. About, it's 51 years later. We're still talking about Woodstock. Last question. Really? Why? Why? Why are we still talking about Woodstock? Because we're still alive. We're not dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that we're... We're talking about Woodstock because everybody contributed from the town who made, you know, sandwiches to the police, to the, you know, the, the army who threw flowers down to the audience, to the staff that was phenomenal and, and the musicians that just, and the sound and just everything that was, everybody just kept giving to this yeah. event and yeah, getting it through to the end in the best way we could and nobody's ever other than a war or something nobody's ever done that i mean for melanie and jocko you guys must have played other festivals uh not but nothing in comparison to woodstock no, no. It's, it's so <laughs> i mean i i played in Go isle ahead. of Wight and glastonbury several times and no, that I mean, they, they were all great. They had moments and everything, but Woodstock had something else, and it was magic. It was magic. Yeah, and that's absolutely. All was yeah, and that kind of cooperation on both sides, in terms of all the technical people, and in terms of an audience, that will never happen again. It was just a unique time in our history as a country and the, the 60s and the assassinations of Dr. King, of the Kennedys. I mean, it, it was a stressful, serious time. And this was uh, the festival that claimed the name and claimed the importance to the, the youth of America. And now we're, we're at, at a new 
chapter in getting involved with what's going on. So everybody vote in ways. You know, I, I I just don't see that when when you say that will never happen again. I don't believe that. I totally believe okay. that we're gearing up for something else. Something something yeah. is I agree with you. I think that Woodstock was a blueprint. And all of us who experienced it, all of us who saw the movie and weren't even born yet, but now have Woodstock in our souls, we know what, what can be done. And I think that's right. It's the time is coming close for something. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want to personally say thank you to each and every one of you guys. You've all contributed uh, so much and been so generous with your time. Uh, maybe Joshua White, I, I think I've harassed you for years. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he agrees. Um, and that's that, you know, you could have told me to F off and not answer, but you didn't. So I appreciate that. Uh, even John Morris, I'll call him out of the blue and say, hey, John, this date and that date. And what do you remember here? And Melanie, you've participated in a lot of our events. Tisha, you know, I can't thank you enough. And Chris Langhart, man, um, what a wealth of knowledge you are. And Jocko, um, you as well. Bill Hanley, of course, brings us all together. He's the bind, binding glue for all, all of this panel because the reason why we're here is because of this book, The Last Seat in the House, the story of Hanley Sound, which everybody is in here prominently. Uh, every one of you are in this book. And, uh, of course, we wouldn't be talking about Woodstock if, we, if it didn't have good sound, uh, both on the sound, the level of within the soundtrack and, of course, the film. So we'd have thank, we have Bill Hanley to thank for that very much, uh, for giving... Uh, the 60s, a, a voice in that way, right? Um, and um, one thing, I, I was looking at some of my ephemera here. I, I'm a collector, but um, I, someone gave, a, 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 an attendee gave me this newspaper, and uh, this is Middletown, New York. Uh, 400,000 flood site, rock crisis eases off. And this came out uh, Saturday, August 16th, 1969. And... Um, it's just to put into perspective uh, and with media, of course, we're on social media right now. So everything's really, in, you know, it's instant. Uh, but here's a newspaper that must have freaked the hell out of people. <laughs> 400,000 people to show up in a little town, I would say is very overwhelming and must have scared a lot of people. So it scared um, them for 50 years i think that they didn't want that to ever ever happen again until somebody bought the field and now it's belongs to some bank or something but, yeah yeah but on that note if do you all does anybody have any lasting uh, anything last to say yeah, i just I want to close how, uh john i'd like to know how and bill will probably join me in this how come langhart who's the same age as we are doesn't have a white hair in his head I don't know. That's a, it's it, a question. Whether the New York State Mass Gathering Act, and that that is what makes us different somehow. I guess I don't know. I think the uh, no. the lawyers were determined not to have it happen again. Oh, I see. I, I think you, I, I don't think that was the answer to your question, John. <laughs> I, th I think he just he just it's playing about uh, mineral. <laughs> Anybody it's about mineral? Yeah, good he's got living. Good mineral. Yeah, he's got, he's got good yeah. he eats a lot of peanut butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys and happy right. anniversary. Happy yeah. Woodstock. Yeah. And, and Joshua White, I'm sorry yeah. Woodstock wasn't so great for you, but no, I want to let but hold on a second, but you are a legend. I mean you're 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 thank you're you. I love I I always loved your work, even before I met Hanley. It was, thank you. I, I'm a visual I, I artist. Got to, yeah. I got to meet Melanie. Oh, hi. I got to be with My Melanie. Friend, we're friends with Maddie. Spent, spent, spent in, in, intimate time with Melanie, who I've known my whole life, just never met her. Cool. Are you all, you all, yeah. you, all of you are legends. Every one of you. I want to say thank you so much. This is a, a I just hall. say hi to John yeah. Morris. Go ahead. Hey, Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, the, this is the, the, the hall of, of Woodstock legends here. And I uh, wish you the best in life. And uh, please stay safe and uh, stay healthy. And um, I'm sure I'll be calling you at some point to harass you about some detail somewhere along the line. But uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Love, you guys. Bye. Love you, guys. Bye. Love you, guys. Thank you, guys, Bye. so much. Thank you so much. Leave the law.
me go right down here. 